Welcome to Drive the DAF. Clear, structured explanation of the daily DAF in 20 minutes. You can even follow in the car. Sechazor Shoshana DAF Chav Gimel begins with a discussion of different types of cedar trees. The Gemara is quoting a Mishnah, which has identified an eight Erez cedar tree. And the Gemara speaks about up to ten different types of trees within the cedar family. We will have some Agarita about the functions of these different trees and how they were harvested. Then we will discuss the mountains used in sending fire signals about Rish Chodesh, which mountains there were and how far they are. And we'll get to two Mishnayas. First Mishnah will discuss how the witnesses testifying to the birth of the new moon arrived in Yerushalayim and where they were kept and what they had while they waited to be seen by the Bezdin. And the second Mishnah discusses the beginning of the process of how they were seen by the Bezdin and how they were interrogated. So we begin at the two dots, about... uh, sixth of the way through the page. And the Mishnah had said that there were klunsois, long poles made of cedar, made of eras. So the Gemara says, Rabbi Huda says that there are four types of eras trees. And Rabbi Baravuna says that there are ten types of eras trees. The four that Rabbi Huda identifies are called eras, kasrom, eitz shemen, and brosh. Kasrom, the Gemara says, is called adra, that's an eider tree. Uh, and Rabbi Shila's yeshiva says it's called Mavliga, and some say it's called Gumish. Now, what are the ten types that Rabbi Bar Rav Huna had? So, the more quotes a pasuk in Yeshaya that lists seven of them. So, you have Erez, Shita, Hadas, Eitz Shemen, uh, Barosh, Tidhar, and Saashur. So, what are these seven things? So, the Gemara says Erez is the Arza, that's the classic cedar tree. Uh, Shita, the Gemara says, is a Tornisa. Rashi says that's a pine tree. Hadas is the classic Hadas we have on Asukas, that's myrtle. A Shemin is a Farsimon, that's the balsam tree. Barosh is the boxwood, which the Gemara calls v- v- Varta. Tidhar is a fir tree, the Gemara calls that Shaga. Tashor is Shorivna. Rashi and Rashi Bamsi also, they don't know what that is. So the the Gemara says these are only seven. What are the other three? So Gemara says Rav Dimi came and he added three, and they were Alonim, Almonim, and Almogin. And others say Aronim, Armonim, and Almogin. Now, what are these? So Alonim is Butmi, that's the elm tree. Almonim is Bluti, that's an oak tree. And Almogin is a coral. Now, Almogim are in both lists. The other list had Aronim instead of Alonim. That's the chestnut tree. And it had Almogin. Um, and it had Aronim. It had Aronim, Armonim, and Almogin. So Aronim is Ari, that's a laurel tree. Armonim is uh, chestnut, that the word calls Dovi. And Almogin is again the coral, like we had before. So now the Gemara discusses coral more or less and how you harvest it. So the Gemara says you need a mighty ship to harvest coral. The Gemara quotes the um, Pasuk in Yishai, which refers to the stream which will come out of the base of Migdash in future, in times of Mashiach, and it will spread to be a mighty river. And even a mighty ship, it says, will not be able to cross it. So the Gemara says that mighty ship is called a borni, a great borni. What do they do with it? How is it used? It was used to harvest coral. How so? So they needed a lot of workforce. So they had either 6,000 men working for 12 months or 12,000 men working for 6 months, same amount of man hours. And they would fill up this uh, ship with sand in shallow water until it sunk and rested on the seafloor. And then they would have divers who would go with long flax ropes that are very strong, and they would tie them, one into the ship and one into the roots of the coral, and they would make it very taut, and then they would unload the sand from the ship. And as they did that, it began to rise, and as it rose, it pulled the coral out by its roots. And this coral was so valuable that it was traded for twice its volume in silver. And the Gemara says there were three ports that did a major business in very expensive materials. Two were Aramean, one is Persian. The two Aramean ones would sell coral, and the Persian ones would sell pearls, and they were both called the royal ports. All three were called the royal ports. Says Rav Yechanan, something else on the subject of the shita. 
Shita, which we said was myrtle. Gemara said, uh, the Shita was pine, that is. Gemara says, every Shita tree that the Nachrim take from Yerushalayim, the Kachabarach is going to restore. Like it says, Etein ba Midbar Erez Shita. I will put back into the Midbar the Erez, which is a Shita. Now, what's a Midbar? That refers to Yerushalayim, like it says, Tziyayin Midbar Hayasa. Says Rehachanan, further on the subject of Hadasim, Myrtle, anybody who learns Torah and does not teach it to others, is compared to a Hadas tree in the middle of the desert. Because it's very beautiful to have a Hadas tree, but it doesn't get much, nobody enjoys it. If it's uh, out in the desert and there isn't anything that it can benefit anyone. I know the different version of this says that it's a good thing, where it says that anybody who learns Torah and does teach it to others in a place where there is no one else to teach, then he becomes like a Hadas in the Midbar because he's the only tree around and he gives tremendous life, especially the good smell of the Hadas and fruits to others. Says Rav Yechanan, woe is to the Evdei Kechavim, the idol worshippers that they cannot restore what they have ruined when they killed Rabbi Akiva and his Chavirim, the Asar Haruki Malchus. Because other things are replaceable, but they are not. Like the Pasuk in Yeshaya says that in that Tachas Hanachoshes of Izov, I'll replace copper with gold. Tachas Abarzel of Ikesef, I'll replace iron with silver. Tachas Eitzim Nachoshes, Tachas Avonim Barzel. So all these things are replaceable, but Tachas are Bikiv Chaverav. There you can't replace anything. So the Gemara, this is summed up by the Pasuk in Yov, Ini Kesi Domam Loni Kesi. I will not cleanse their blood. I cannot replace or cleanse their blood in any way. Okay, the Gemara now quotes the Mishnah again. The Mishnah said that they lit the fires, and it listed five mountains that they used to send the signal from one to the next. One of them was Base Balton. The Gemara says, what's Base Balton? The Gemara says, it's a mountain called Biram. What's a mountain called Gulo? The Gemara says, that refers to Pompadisa. These are already far out into the uh, Chutzlars outside Eretz Yisrael. Now, it says in the Mishnah that they stood there until they saw the entire face of the exile of the diaspora lit up like a bonfire. The Gemara says what happened was that everybody who saw the fires took a torch, went up on the roof of his house, and waved it around so you could see flames from all over the place. Now, there's a different brazer that lists some other mountains involved. Rashim ben Elazar says, Charim, Kair, and Gader, and Chavusel. These are all around. These were all involved. So the Gemara says, these mountains, how did they fit into the mountains we have in our Mishnah? So there's two versions. Some say that they were between the mountains in the Mishnah. They served as intermediary links. And some say they were in a different part of Eretz Yisrael. So it was a different set of signals that was sent in a different direction. And so each one uh, was referring to, so if that's the case, then the Mishnah and the Bryce are not contradictory because each one is referring to its own direction. Now what is the distance between the mountains? The Gemara says it's eight parsois. Eight parsois Five mountains, between five m- mountains you have four skips, f- four jumps. That would mean that you were able to travel a distance of 32 parsa from Yerushalayim. The says, but it's much further than 32 parsa from Yerushalayim to get to Chutzlars. The Gemara says, not a problem. The road has gotten longer, not because it got stretched, but because the straight path is no longer passable. You have to take a roundabout route in order to be able to get there. But if you go as the crow flies or as the fire shines... Then you can. Uh, then it's only uh, thirty-two parsois. Mar quotes a pasuk on that. L'chein hini sachas drachacha basirim that the way got messed up with uh, thorns. And Rav Nachman says, as it says, nesiva saiva, he twisted my paths. All right, we well now begin our next Mishnah. The Mishnah discusses how the witnesses who came to testify were treated when they arrived in Yerushalayim. So the Mishnah says there was a large courtyard in Yerushalayim. It was called Beis Yazek. Um, and that is where they would keep all the witnesses. They gathered over there, and the basin would come and take them one at a time. And there was a big feast prepared over there in order to convince people to come. It's a lot of uh, food, so they shouldn't want to not go. Somebody who wasn't sure whether he should go or not, this might sway him and get him to make the decision to go to uh, Yerushalayim. Now, um, were they allowed to leave the Tchum? If they arrived on Shabbos, so they were Mechal al Tchum, so generally the Allah is somebody who's outside his Tchum is only allowed to travel four Amas. He's not allowed to go any further than that. So the Gemara says in the beginning they were not allowed to leave, were not allowed to move more than four Amas because they're outside their Tchum. But I'm going to to make things easier for them that they were allowed to travel the entire Tchum of the city 
and uh, just like anybody else who started out Shabbos in Yerushalayim in order that they shouldn't suffer from their decision to come. And the uh, same is true for anyone who leaves his tchum with permission for a reason that he's allowed to. And that applies to a midwife who goes to help somebody give birth, somebody who travels to help save things from a fire, or from a marauding troop, or from a flooding river, or from a falling mountain, or from an avalanche. Any of these people who go with permission have the entire tchum of all the people in the city that they arrive within. Now, the Gemara wants to know, we said that this courtyard is called based Ya'azek. The Gemara wants to know, is it Ya'azek with an ayin, or is it Ya'azek just without an ayin? The difference is Ya'azek would mean ringed by a fence. Ya'azek without an ayin would mean that it's uh, trapped, that they feel imprisoned there, like Azikim means handcuffs. So Gemara says, it's difficult to say that they felt in pain and trapped, because we said they made a big feast for them, so they were very comfortable. They in, They enjoyed it. So you can't say that they felt trapped. True, they were stuck there, at least in the beginning, because they couldn't leave because of the tum problems, but they didn't feel uh, like they suffered. Whereas, no, it's possible that they had both sensations at the same time. They felt honored because of the feast, but they also felt trapped because they couldn't leave. All right, now we get to the second Mishnah on the daf. The Mishnah says, how would they interview the witnesses? So the Gemara says that they took the first pair that arrived first, and they brought them into uh, room and they started with the all, with the larger one, the greater one. And they asked him, "Tell me what you saw. Did you see it in front of the sun or behind the sun?" And where I'll explain what that means. Did you see it north of the sun or south of the sun? How high was it from the ground? And in which direction was it tilted? How wide was it? How big was it? Uh, if he said he saw it in front of the sun, his testimony is void because he could never be in front of the sun. Afterwards, once they've validated the testimony so they didn't need any other witnesses um well they had the first pair so after they brought the first one they interviewed the second one and if the two fit together it was qualified and then we accepted their testimony we didn't really need any other ones theoretically we could have sent them home but then they wouldn't come again the next time when they might be the only ones to see it so we took all the people and interviewed them one by one at least the main headings just so that they felt that their trip was worthwhile all right, so now the Gemara wants to know what's the difference between in front of the sun and behind the sun, and north of the sun and south of the sun. So Rashi explains as the sun sets, it's traveling from south to north. Uh, late in the day, at the sun's highest moment of Chatzos, it is to the south of overhead, and it's moving north as it moves west. So it's moving northward. So if you're saying that, a, that the uh, moon, again, the only time, the only place that the moon is visible at the Moad is when the sun is at the end of the day when the sun begins to set. It's not visible in the morning. When the, so when the sun is already set or just about to set, that's when you can see the moon. And the moon is right near the sun. So if it was in, in front of the sun, it means that it's heading northward ahead of the sun. And it's north of the sun. Behind the sun means that it's south of the sun. So why are these two different things? What does the mean by this? So the Gemara says, no, in front of the sun and behind the sun means which way was it angled? Was the uh, concave or the convex side of the moon crescent facing the sun was the open side of the arc of the moon facing the sun or was the the rounded side facing the moon now if they said that the open side was facing the sun so their testimony is but entirely because the open side is never facing the sun the sun illuminates the moon and therefore the crescent side of it the rounded side always has to be the part of the moon that's closer to the sun the moon brings a pasuk to support us and says that that means to say that no one that the uh, open side of the moon never faces the sun, and the open side of a rainbow never faces the sun. What's the reason that Hashem set it up that way? Um, it, the open side of the moon, which is viewed as the injury of the moon, where the moon shrunk when it complained, never faces the sun because the sun would be upset. Uh, that it caused the moon to shrink itself. And the open side of a rainbow can never face the sun because the people who worship the sun would say that the sun is shooting an arrow. It's using the rainbow as an arrow. Because when you fire a b- when you uh, f- f- fire an arrow from the, the, the bow, so you have the curved part curves away from you. So it's it couldn't be like that, and it's got to be that the rounded part is always facing the sun. So what have we learned today on the daf? We've learned about the ten 
types of cedar trees, possibly four types. Numero describes and, and, and lists each one. We learned how we pull coral out of the riverbed by floating a ship that's tied to the roots of it. We learned about the Agatha that Hashem will restore all the cedars that were taken from Yerushalayim. We learned that uh, someone who is a Tamil Chacham who does not teach, or passively if he does teach, he's considered to be unique, alone in the wilderness. And we learned that Rabbi Kiva and his friends are not replaceable. We also learned about the mountains. There were five mountains, possibly three more in between. They were eight parsais apart for a total of 32 parsais. Um, we learned about the names of some of the mountains and the places in which they were. We learned about the courtyard where the witnesses would wait. And it was possibly called Yazek or Yazek. There was a feast there. We learned about the interviews that the Beisden would conduct, and they would ask them all kinds of questions to make sure that they really had seen the moon and not something else. Drive the Daf is a project of the Grand Woodland Shul and is presented by Rabbi Yitzchak Landa. Find us on YouTube or subscribe to daily emails by emailing drivethedaf at gmail.com.